He's back, but he had a root canal today. He's not here. So I'm delighted to introduce a friend of the Humanities Center and a friend of mine, our Professor Anka Vazopoulos, who is no stranger to the Humanities Center. She's been a resident scholar several times. She's been on the advisory board. She's done many brown bag talks. She's been a participant in the conferences and the symposia. She's a professor in the English department. She's a specialist, and I'll mention her specialties, but uh, 19th century women's studies, all those things. She's also a creative writer, and today she's taking her, her contribution from her creative side. Creative side. I don't mean that scholarship isn't creative, but I'm talking about creative writing as an art. She's the author of the New Bedford Samurai, Penguins in the Warming World, which came out in 2007, and for which she got the Board of Governors Award uh, in 2009. She's done a book, No Return Address, a memoir of displacement. She's done two other books. She's done three books of poetry uh, and an opera libretto. She's, in her scholarly research, she has done a, a, a book on literary criticism entitled The Symbolic Method of Coleridge, Baudelaire, and Yeats. She's done over 30 scholarly articles and book chapters in the 19th century on globalization, animal culture, British, French, and Italian literature. She's a comparatist. Feminist Criticism, Theater and Film. Uh, she's published over 200 poems and short stories in literary print and in online magazines. And her short story, three poems, were nominated for the Pushcart Prize. So she's, quite, she's quite productive and she has time to work in university uh, committees and everything else as well, and English department affairs as well. This project today, her poetry comes from this project, this collection of poetry, which is thematically related to the concept of the Bausphere. And she'll explain that as, instead of a traditional globe. Her poems will talk about, she's written poems in this collection, I don't know what poems she'll read today, but poems on map making by humans. She's, doing po she's written poems uh, about animals sharing space with humans, and poems about migration, and patterns of non human life that all too often are, ignored, are being ignored and destroyed in our culture. So it gives me great pleasure and pride to introduce a friend of the humanities center, a friend of mine, a, a scholar a, and creative writer in our rights. Please join me in warmly welcome Professor Hunter Vazal. I'm going to stand because it's easier for me. So I'm just going to go very quickly through this slide presentation. That's the cover and that's the albatross, the short-tailed albatross that features prominently in my book. Uh, it may be the protagonist, for all I know. Um, it's, a, it's a species that was, decla was de declared extinct by the Audubon Society in, in 1949. Uh, but then it was actually rediscovered. There were about 30, 30 birds still alive in the 50s. And uh, the person who was my, my spiritual guide through this journey is the Japanese ornithologist who's responsible for bringing the species back from the brink of, brink of extinction. And so it's part of this, uh, it, it's an inspiration, a backdrop for what I'm trying to do now. I'm going to go very briefly through this. This is, this is a skeleton of a humpback uh, at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Uh, these these uh, species, this species was also hunted near extinction, but fortunately it's recovering now. Um, here's a live one from a whale watch with a baleen showing and all the birds around it that benefit from this, this ecosystem. That's uh, um, the pigeon on my other You know, whales love to do this. They get really close to ships. They splash the people. They love to hear them scream. Um, seriously. OK, this is, this is all sad. These are the birds in the, in the Smithsonian collection. They have what they call bird skins which are obviously, you know, birds gutted and filled with, with arsenic and sawdust and so on to preserve them against, against pests. Um, and I was able to see the collection there when I was doing research. To give you an idea of, this is a live one. Again, the color's not coming through. It's pretty spectacular. The, the bill is pink. It's got blue at the tip. The head is golden. Um, here are the, the, the juveniles who, you know, basically look like all juveniles, all delinquent, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they mate for life, so I thought this is a very romantic picture. And they have a very interesting mating dance. Um, I don't know, again, I don't know why it's not reproducing very well, but 
Uh, there, this is a very old picture, as you can tell, a uh, black and white picture. Uh, there are about five million on Kurishima, this, this island, which means bird island, uh, which was their main site for colonies, although they were in other uh, Pacific islands of the, of the Ring of Fire. Um, a whole bunch more there. This is what happened when they started harvesting them. They, uh, they, they killed them to near extinction. They are very valuable. They have very beautiful feathers, and it's for the feather trade. Uh, around the 1890s, uh, the United States and Europe imported 235 tons of bird feathers a year. Now, if you know how many feathers go to make a pound, you get an idea of how many birds had to be killed to fill that insatiable oh, thirst for, you know, the fin de siècle attire, yeah, the plans yeah. and the costumes, and the and women actually wore uh, bird skins on their on their uh, hats and so on. And that's what we have, you know, that's 1920. Uh, the Japanese government declared them a national monument in 1932. These people are still making a living from hunting them, and not as good a living because there were very few. Uh, so they decided they were going to kill all of them, and it was believed that they had succeeded. Now I'm going to show you maps. This is this is the interest that I have now, and these are these are fairly old. These are from the from the uh, 15th century, and you can see already that they you know that it's full of animals and of people. Um, Everything in the sea is, is everything is populated by by creatures and humans, uh, and you'll see that some of us are not obviously realistic. And often, when they were doing uh, maps of Africa, well, they knew the lions lived in Africa, so wherever they didn't know something in terms of, of the actual uh, topography of the place, they'd stick a lion on the map. At least they were cognizant that there were living things on Earth. This is a close up. And this is again, the, the, as you can see, the biosphere and what's around it in terms of illustrations. Um, this is a, a map of, uh, of South America. You can see the prominent parrots there. Another top of a map with all kinds of creatures and, and living things and the, the, the winds um, anthropomorphized there. Um, this is a picture of, of uh, eastern United States. There's Cape Cod, there's Massachusetts, and you see what's there. Uh, not exactly drawn to scale, a big fat turkey. Uh, and animals here too, uh, something that looks like a whale. They were not really terribly sure what they looked like so much. Again, one of these, these ancient maps, and take a look at what's on the side of it. This is where it gets interesting in terms of uh, imaginary habitations and inhabitants. So, I guess, um, the kinds of things that Othello talks about, from his travels and so on, but they're, they're also populating this map with uh, these imagined creatures, you know, as you can see the, the centaur here, the, the bird-headed, the three-faced three person here, etc. the, the um, um, hermaphrodite, of course. Okay, here are some living uh, animals that were, were very deeply affected by the uh, by the Gulf spill, and a lot of them died. We like to forget about that because it happened a long time ago. This is what people do when they interact with animals; they act stupid um, most of the time. So that's 
that's what I have to show in terms of, you know, what what remains. And what we have is very little. This is a National Wildlife Refuge. You know, the, the, the ibises, of course, are by the side of the road. And Florida is amazing in that respect. That you, know, you look, you go to the refuge to see the wood stork, and you see not, no, no trace of the wood stork. And then you're driving to the airport, and in some drainage ditch on the side, you see the wood stork. Because birds don't know this is a national wildlife refuge. <laughs> I should stay here. I'm safer. You know that sort of thing. So uh, we, in fact, have designated areas for animals and are trying to manage the globe. Since the Mercatorian Revolution, all of this imaginary stuff, as well as real stuff, what inhabits the sea, what animals are on Earth, and so on, it disappeared. If you look at the globe now, and you see at most topography, but you see flat maps. Uh, even on a circular globe, and you see the imaginary lines of longitude, uh, latitude, and the equator, which we take to be real. And it's really interesting that, that what is completely imaginary has become real. Um, and so I'm going to start with uh, what I'm writing about, which is human interactions with, uh, with animals, uh, which is part of this larger project that I'm doing on uh, how animals have created their paths and their habitats and how we do not map these and therefore think that you know they're in the way. For instance, that wonderful heroic thing that happened where the pilot took the plane and landed it in, in the middle of the Hudson River and saved everybody from, from dying from a crash because the Canada geese were in the way. Um, no. <laughs> Canada geese, geese were doing what geese do. The plane was in the way of the Canada geese. And now, uh, I think the Federal Aviation uh, Board, as long as it's still going to be funded, we'll see how long that goes before we go away with those government regulations, um, is actually sending scientists from the Smithsonian ornithologists to check on feathers that are found in airports and on runways to find out when migration of particular birds occurs so that the planes, because the scientists know at what level, what altitude these birds fly depending on the species, to know exactly how to coordinate the flight of airplanes so as not to run into birds for our benefit, not the birds, but it helps out everybody. So it's a good thing. All right, so um, in, in the neighborhood where I live, um, people are very worried about other people moving in. You know, school of choice is a big thing uh, now. And, uh, and I always find this bizarre and, and disturbing, but there it is. But the discourse quickly shifts to other things as well. So I call this postmodern threats. Uh, and there's a, an epigraph that I took from uh, a scientific article on this. Despite years of being trapped, shot, and poisoned, coyotes have maintained their members and continue to increase in the East. It used to be, no doubt still is, the blacks from just across the invisible barrier, us, them, the yellow hordes, if all the folks in China jumped at once. Now what pursues us is merely what we've done. Shadows drying up, as when a car sweeps its clean swath of light, chasing night briefly away, jaws slack with famished desire, yellow eyes, bones under tan red apparel, deliquescent, so they can flow in and out of yards, our marked and guarded property, take what some of us most cherish, Sweet, small, helpless dog, cat, agile, but not enough. We spin our horror tales of these invaders come over Great Lake ice, like those who crossed from Asia, whom we also ruthlessly displaced. Um, this is another poem about what we bring as we go on our migrations, because human beings are the most restless species on Earth. We just don't stay put. We just move from one place to another to another. So this is called Leaving Traces, and I have a companion poem that just came out in the Hawaii Pacific Review, uh, and you see. Um, this is inspired by, by a photograph, Leaving Traces. On this moonscape of our own world, the horizon is nothing but water. Undulating cliffs fold into themselves, perhaps to hide them, these snow-filled creases. Toward us, the black back of wetlands stretching from oceanside to a more tranquil plain, 
before does black back surely to hide teeming creatures, snail, salamander, horned toad, marsh wren, egret, heron, gulls numberless, least turn. Yet we do not appear as anything more than dots, imperfections, sloppy drops of solvent as we make our way over the plains at the foot of the serpentine cliffs. Look at us, easily disposed of, a mere erasure with a very small stroke of an imaginary pen in a program called paint. Yet think, roach, rat, flea, louse, termite, mouse, mosquito, sparrows, pigeons, mute swans, scotch thistle, wild mustard, loose stripe. We carry them willy and milly with us wherever we, no matter how small or lost, go. And then, of course, there's this rage against introduced, I mean, in, in, in invasive species. And so they're not invading, invading anything. They're staying, they're staying where they are. We bring them with us. <laughs> they're introduced species. Um, this is called Sailing to Hawaii, and it's from Melanie. Uh, I think you'll recognize the antecedent in poetry, but it's also uh, have, having to do with, with this issue. Will you expect your boat to sail? Not empire on the boards, but canvas pregnant with the spice winds, bearing up colossal wingspan of albatross, carrying scents of ripe mangoes, orchids full blown. We do not expect gold birds, stained wood, oiled dusk bodies blending into canvas, missing their third dimension, for your eye will look both straight and round. The butterfly will light on Buddha, yet take off again. If you abjure this continent breaking off, falling in under the weight of its excesses, you will not take with you, let loose, the feral pig to root out paradise. If you return, your steerage will not hold pearls of the tear-drowned eye, feathers torn, flight skins from their native bloom. Your sails will still have furled, your boards not shrunk, not waterlogged, but like the tall straight pine born on the lifeblood of this azure planet, tough and smooth, salt cured. This, there's a case in which there's a migration of a person. <coughs> uh, it's a life-threatening disease, and she went to Hawaii for her health, and it worked for a little while. Okay. Um, I also write about unglamorous species like bugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> there are two, two poems about, about these. Um, called, this first one is called Tardy Bugs. This October warm haze cheats us into hallucinating summer. Roses pump up sparse buds with a fury that would give cabbage blooms if this weather went on. Bumblebees nap on gara flowers, bending, swaying on filaments. The afternoon blushes and efflorescence, inexplicable numbers fill the air, settle on brick on white door as if on sandy beaches in the Bahamas. Eyeing rapacious eyes staring from leaves of the crab apple that is now animate with screams and jostlings, I urge these absurd polka dot balls underground. You don't know what's coming, and if you all get caught by the frost, get picked out by beaks like coins thrown among the crowd. What will happen in spring when the ants will shepherd their aphid flocks up the tenderest shoots, I say as I brush them away from the crack of the door. They bursting orange, then gathering themselves into compact hemispheres, soaking, soaking the last of the sun. And this is warming still. This summer, men pretending to own the world meet to carve it up according to specs drawn by their puppeteers. Outside, mothers howl for children clobbered, hair yanked out, air made vicious with gas to make us weep. We've seen this stuff before, so many times before. The planet imperceptibly revolves its blues and greens, and pictures from the dark we only can imagine show us smaller patches of white caps more green, more yellow, where they haven't been. On the news, sharks bite and eat a few of the crowds using the oceans as pleasure pools. The news tells us 
of how to fight the sharks, a former lobbyist, now government employee, to watch the industry for which she lobbied, says, We're allowed to sh we've allowed the sharks to go unhunted for too long. A ladybug lands on your neck and bites, on your friend's hand and bites, on your sister's knee and bites. This we have not yet seen. This perhaps we should take as a sign. Um, the title of this poem is from a news story. Seabirds continue to wash up on Oregon coast. No tree has yet answered to the name. No plant. Unless you count those housemates who learn to syncopate their symmetries to the imprisoned anguish inside Mozart's giddy violins. So now these birds, a half a world away from mammals who, through human, all to human, fancy, name them, these rhinoceros of open waters diving 200 feet to scoop just a small sardine, these formal black-white auklets attending their acrobatic balls show up in droves on coasts, washed up, drowned, tuxedoed for their own funeral, as if in solidarity a half a world away with horned beasts who too are gone. Um, some years ago I went to Malta for a conference and um, Malta, the nation, is two islands. One which is Malta and the other one is Gozo. And Gozo is the sort of kinder, gentler version. But I was on Malta where of course the university is and so on. And uh, it was a frightening place. And uh, the poem tries to speak to that. Malta dream. This is how it will be, and only for those who can pay. The way it is here and now. Half a million souls on a rock, farming water from seas ever hotter, shallower, each saint day with its gay banners and paper mache debris, choked in fumes, each trip taking a little longer, each boat bobbing in others' wake. But large no more, squared like terraced earth, only fish hemmed into aquaculture, only bird song from balcony cages, then evermore reading lights, water interrupted, breath even holding hands, kissing in unbearable, violent heat. Um, I was walking around campus, I had about 15 minutes between one meeting and this, and um, I was trying to find a quiet place, and as it's really very difficult anywhere, if, if you try to listen, uh, to be away from human sounds. Mm -hmm. I think there are only, you know, uh, auditory places, I mean, you know, these, these should be uh, uh, refuges as well, that have become very few and far between and very precious, because there are very few places. If you're out on open water in the middle of St. Clair, you can still hear roars of motors and so on. So there's no place you can go that is completely free of human sounds unless you go really, really far away um, and then, um, you know, get eaten by bears and then you know, say it's the bears <laughs> and so on. So this is called Lost in Modernity. It used to be full-breasted, open-bloused, Summer, we climbed upon the cusp of July August, spinning out of her many teated self strands of cotton candy, shielding us like mother's palm against fierce rays, sugaring our days, filled with long silences pierced by alarm like peeps of fledglings, exoskeletons, the cadan, danse macabre. We devour her globes of plenitude. Tomatoes, apricots, nectarines, green of honeydew, sunset of cantaloupes. But now, as she profitably spends her last, waning each day before her eyes, we drill her silences, infect the plume of sugared air each minute of each day. Motorboats, motorbikes, jet skis, chainsaws, mowers, hedgers, trimmers, power washers, now that we no longer make or gentle anything by hand. 
her body ruptured to shards, still spins haphazard strands like tattered, tattered spider webs, whose sweetness we taste if at all in scorching, violent haste. Um, this, uh, this poem uh, is, some, is based on an actual experience that I had this summer. Um, and it, in a sense, discloses to, to <coughs> not that it you know, requires an actual experience to make us think of this, but um, it, it brought, you know, rather unpleasantly to mind how we justify what we do uh, to other living beings on Earth. How we explain. Having bought ourselves at a price we barely can afford this bit of respite, we walk downhill over, then over the Herring River to the sandy beach, a bay on the Atlantic. On the bridge, two boys, just edging past the revings of puberty, are throwing small rocks, it looks like, in front of cars. As we approach, we see two blue crabs scrabbling, legs, pincers in the air, fighting for a hold so they can get themselves to what they fight for, safety. The older boy laughs as the first crab gets smashed and smashed and smashed. Drivers unwilling accomplices on this narrow bridge where there's no room to swerve. I save one crab. We chide the boys. The older says, it bit me. As if the crab, like moving monsters, rose of its own volition from depths of herring river, thus justifying its hot pavement, slow dismembering. Um, this is another one, sort of in the same vein, called Duck Economies. And uh, I just want to mention that for my the celebration of my 35th year at the university, I got this catalog, and it had a scope in it, and I thought, oh, good, a scope. And, you know, it was a piece of crap. <laughs> so that enters the point. It's, okay, so it's duck economies as well as other economies. Technically, I'm so inferior. Binoculars, expensive for me, still under 500. Scope, only a child's toy, reward for 35 years teaching. So I mostly, with frozen hands, watery eyes, guess at beak color, wing tip, ringed neck. No regal shapes of canvas backs could tell horns and clarinets of tundra swans. When home, I Google thinking luminous close-ups will vivify my fading visual snaps. Among the photos of these serenes, illusionists on lake skin, one microsecond caught in lenses round, next arching, vanished as if they'd never been. I see shots of children triumphant, high-tech guns slung over shoulders, holding aloft, jaw, uh, dog jaws clamped on lifeless bodies. See carcasses accompanied by game cooking tips. These are the diving ducks, by the way. That's why they just Uh, this is about migration paths, and sort of about my, my, I felt as if I were in migration this, uh, this past year, ever since the, uh, the hideous legislature took over, and we had to have rally after rally after rally to Lansing, um, so this is called Above the Lansing Rally. In a horrendous month of rains and winter cold, the gods favoring common people for once Seem to prevail. A crisp, almost caressing April day, the lawn before the Capitol crowded with tents, tables, podiums, microphones blaring, people taking up the chance. This is our house! This is our house! Above, disturbed, but not enough to be moved off. For had they not withstood the forest down, marshes filled in, meadows paved over, noise, poisons, rises, attract space, murderous squares of solid light. 
See their wax wings flare, their banded tails chitter to chide this rowdy bunch, flitted uneasily from pine to locust to sycamore, never making up minds to leave as yet. Since they, not we latecomers, destroyers of each other's livelihoods and sometimes lives, have dug indelible these channels of their travels. This is our house for what to us must be, though we waste not a thought on it, infinity. And to leave you with a slightly more cheering <laughs> thought about what migration does for us, um, especially in spring. Migration in fall is a bit melancholy, but uh, this is what uh, it does for us in spring, what migrants bring. Just a couple of days before official spring, a spectacular technicolor sunset, a day, only a day after a snowstorm, the white lingers but as shamed shadows in sheltered patches, all else ablaze in this arrogant light. But not only spume of airplanes catching, exploding brightness cuts the horizon. These lines, these V lines, almost too thin, these tentative wavering hard pencils lined like illusions like floaters in tired eyes, keep sketching themselves over and over, moving, drawn northward, drawing northward, sowing black seas from sky to sky, trailing iridescent silk capes, those fabulous regions, warm light. Thank you. We open for discussion with her and questions and comments, reactions. I'm curious, all those fascinating maps, where do you find all of those in the Mar Maritime Museum somewhere? I went to the Library of Congress, okay. to the map room. And I had, uh, you know, librarians are the people I really like best as professionals. She, Judy. <laughs> she means that I too, love too. library. Because I, I entered into correspondence, I sort of write these very tentative notes saying, oh, you know, I'm trying to do this, and, you know, and it sounds like, you know, weird project and so on. Would you be able to direct me to some stuff? And all of a sudden, well, you know, I can do this, and there's this other person who knows about oh, yeah, this, yeah. and would you like to talk to the director who's going to open up the collections to you, and oh, so yeah. on and so forth. So I make an appointment there, and I go there for a couple of days, and everybody's just immensely helpful. And it's a really interesting thing, because a lot of these maps have not been put on, on digital access. Well, I would think very, so. I mean, absolutely. They're very old and very fragile. Oh, absolutely. They date back to some of them, the, the 13th century. I mean, it's really astonishing. They triplet some wood yes, and all yeah, kinds yeah. of stuff, yeah. And so they have this contraption. It's, uh, Judy, of course, thinks, <laughs> who doesn't know this? But <laughs> yeah, I do. There's this, this thing that looks like a, like an aluminum step, step ladder, only it's sturdier uh -huh. and it's got a platform. So they spread out a huge map for you on the table. Okay. And you stand there and then photograph it. Oh, that, I wondered how you got yeah. that photograph. That's with, what without a flash. Without yeah, of course, flash. because yeah. that's damaging. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. So, uh, so that's you know that's how I got a lot of those maps. That's where I got them from. Right. And it's it's you know, it's really cool to see a, a 17th century map of Massachusetts where um, the rabbit and the turkey in it are half, half yeah. the size of Cape Cod. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I wondered where you got. So, that's hard. That's they're, unusual stuff. They stay, you know, they were prominent in the minds of those people. The, you know, the, the idea that there was that there was life. You know, the animals right, were prominent. Yeah, yeah. The fish were prominent, particularly the whales, but other fish as well. Um, and so they're always drawn in. And then as the maps become much more utilitarian, yeah. all of that disappears and it's replaced by numbers, by by lines. So on, uh, which of course was very necessary. But what was it necessary for? Conquest and and mercantilism, which is you know a form of conquest. Too, and you're right. I mean, we think of the the equator. I mean, that was an imaginary line. They're not real. But we've sort of 
that's acceptable. I mean, that's yeah. real. Well, things yeah. happen when you go in the southern hemisphere, clearly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the sky looks different yeah, and all that. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean that there's an actual line that you cross, and it was very, it was taken as a, uh, as a real marker, and they did all kinds of rituals, uh, the sailors, um, because of that, mm -hmm. uh, the crossing of the equator, and so on. So, who was this? When did the animals start to kind of disappear, and when did the equator end? Uh, well, actually, this, this, these lines were, were very ancient. Uh, even in, in Ptolemaic maps, they appear. But they're not insistent as they are in our maps. And the longitude and latitude came much later. Um, and uh, the flattening of the globe that could be done to scale was, was Mercator's uh, revolution. And it was his invention. And you know, ever since, you know, kids peeled the orange and put it out there to get an idea of the globe. And that's when the, the real technical stuff started coming in. And that's also, I mean, that coincided with this. Yes. yes. And, and people, because there were these people, yeah. some of whom were imaginary, but others were, you know, native people <laughs> in, in costume, you know, for instance, in, in, in maps of South America. And they're there, and they're as big as the Andes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting that. They, they attain this kind of prominence in the minds of people sure, who join maps. Sure, perception of it. Yeah. So that's, that's what I find really interesting, that you know, we, we teach maps and we, we look at maps and so on, and it, again, it's completely devoid of other life. Sure. I mean, it's for our uses, so, and even of human life. So would you think that like, Google Earth is like a kind of reverse um, kind of um, development, because that's Yeah, there have been photographers who've been trying to do that too. Right. Uh, a lot of you know, just coast to earth photography. Right. Yeah. Also, well, so we just do Google Maps, right? To get a picture of the building. Yes, yes, yes. Well, more more interestingly, they they I mean, National Ge Geographic did this beautiful uh, book and program called Great Migrations, and they've actually. Traced as well as the, the film Wing Migration, which has a program on the, on the, uh, on the computer that you can get, that begins to map the Earth in terms of the movement of other species, and that's really something that's uh, begun, I would say, in the last ten years or so. Look, I'm always am, and I don't want to dominate, but this fast. I mean, I I love doing this last semester because I get I become a student again. <laughs> Tell me uh, sort of the genesis of this interest, because when you think of you doing body and Lair and Yates and that and moving to when this interest in all this, because I find it fascinating really, you know. Some way one gets a hook and gets excited about it and you have to turn it loose or the hook's got you. Yeah. Uh, well you know, I started out as a biology major. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. This was in you know, in the in the sixties when uh, to be a woman in science was, you know, if you had any kind of dignity, it was not, not yeah. a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I ended up saying, no, I'm having a lot more fun in my humanities classes. But the interest was Probably. clearly there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's okay. yes. um, wonderful when you come back to that. And combine but, I, you know, I was attentive to these things because I was privileged enough to live in a very undeveloped country. <laughs> you see you see the contradictions here yes, for both of them. But you know what I'm saying? Uh, when, when we went uh, on vacation, we went to places that had no indoor plumbing right. yes, and yes. no electricity. And and so I was in contact mm -hmm. with you know the natural world in a less mediated way than people are now, even when they go on their great sure, hikes and sure. so on. So, um, I began to be very, very because I was a city kid. For me, this was extraordinary, and it was mm -hmm. it was always interesting. And the closer to nature, you were drawn to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I kept that, and then I, I started reading a lot about um, our very heavy footprint on yes, the yeah, of yeah, the world, yeah. 
and um, I'm always concerned about it and feel guilty all the time about everything that I do. <laughs> like this, you know, everything, everything. But, um, you know, sort of have to negotiate and to live. Well, I'm going to have some of those concerns. I can't write nice poetry like that, but some of those same, uh, that's why it strikes a, a note with me. I, I really... I'm glad. Yeah. 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 I wonder if people who are not interested would be moved by this. That's the, that's the real question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. We are hoping that they will be. Please, I don't mean to dominate. Please. But if you, if you're how not how uh, close yes. are you to drawing this book project to a close? Are you still writing the gaps or? Uh... Oh, I've got a lot, a lot. I have a whole bunch of material which is extremely valuable to me mm -hmm. of um, maps before the Mercatorian Revolution and maps afterwards, and I really have to sit down and and study them and contemplate them and be able to find the space and the time to write, we know how that is. Um, you know, going out to the lake and, and, and seeing what's going on in, in terms of migration, that's a little more accessible, not in terms of time, I still have to struggle to find the time, but it's, it's easier um, because I don't have to be really making the, the mental space for, for something like that. Mm -hmm. I've also got a whole lot of material about uh, scholarly material on how we perceive the world, how various uh, peoples from other parts of the world perceive the world, uh, and, and what kind of representations they may have, and I'm very interested in that. So I'd like to bring that in, if I can. So I, I didn't read the map to making poems that I read last year, but I'm in, in process with those. So it's, it's got another, I think, another year to go. I'm just curious about your process in writing. How do you, I mean, do you start from an encounter, an incident? Do you have an idea and then form it into a niche or a language? I'm just curious about how you start It differs. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it, it really differs. You know, it really differs. Uh, sometimes there's something that happens that I feel I must write about. Uh, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm haunted. Often, I'm, you know, I, I don't know if you can tell, but I hope you can. I'm a very visual poet. Um, and it's, it's a particular sort of mental snapshot that I take of something. I say, how can I? My problem, as far as I can see it, is how to translate this, translate that into language and lose as little as possible mm -hmm. of the, the extraordinary luminosity that it has, you know, in in, in uh, at the moment. Uh, that's that's a tall order, and I feel that I'm never quite there, you know. But that's that's certainly my ambition in that respect. Sometimes they're they're meditative poems, like the poems on on maps. Um, that I did, um, they really are, are somewhat more um, philosophical, let's say, and maybe that's too, too, too uh, arrogant a word, but you it's know, sort of more contemplative than, yeah, than, contemplative, than the yeah. ones that, that deal with the Im immediate imagery. Like the one where you mentioned the boys and the crabs, I mean, I can see where something that impacted you so much that you have to Yeah, and that precisely. <laughs> yes, yes. Did you have to go and write that right away? Some no, writers took, talk it about it. It took me a while. I was so So you were processing it. Okay. It's emotion recollected in tranquility. Well, <laughs> I had to reach tranquility. Okay, so you had to process it. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. If, if I had written what I thought of that. <laughs> All right. That's and murder and mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> And, he, and you know, it is, I mean, a friend of mine said, this is really stupid of you, you eat crabs. I said, yeah, you're right, you have a good point. However, this kind of wanton cruelty for no use. I mean, these crabs are not going to be eaten. Right. You know, not, there was no gain from this except to see them suffer. Right. And, and, of course, my husband says to the kid, he says, uh, 
You know, that's how serial murder starts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And I said, yeah, except he's going to think that's cool. <laughs> he's a teenager, so, you know, whoa, that's good. Yeah, I, I, you know, I like to think that I'm mindful more than just words, although of course, right. yeah, I always, I did want to be an ornithologist. Right. So that was an early passion. But I also was interested in the migration of fish. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, that's that's coming. And you know, I, I, I do. And and what interests me too is how interconnected everything is. So that I'm really not. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, if I, if, I don't know if I convey that, but, um, you know, in, in the poem about the bugs, the, the, the birds are, are the monsters, right. they're, they're, you know, mm -hmm. so it depends on where you situate yourself in the continuum, right. but, but that we're all in this, this kind of web that we should be very careful about tearing. Mm -hmm. um, How has your um, knowledge of Coleridge and Yeats and all these other, um, you know, poets, has that influenced your own poetry in any way? I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, I, 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 that's I, nice. <laughs> I think, as, as when I said, you, you probably can hear some of it, uh, and it's always in my head. It's always with me. It's, uh, you know, sometimes I'd like to open a little patch and, you know, drop that stuff out. <laughs> And, and be be pure in a sense, but actually I think that hybridity and all kinds of mixtures are all to the good. You know, purity is not, not something that we should pride necessarily. So yeah, it's a it's it's a mess in there. And that's why it's very, you know, it, as the hard drive gets more and more loaded, it's harder to retrieve stuff. But certain things yeah. remain, you know, they, they stay with you when they're, um, in the sense that the construction of, of language uh, that, that, that kind of forms you as, as a writer. So you can say I'm corrupted or maybe enriched, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. <laughs> Any other? Well, we thank you. We I'm thank very, you very much. Very it was very useful.